The land of Djibouti was originally inhabited by two ethnic groups, the Afars and the Issas. The Afars are closely related to Ethiopians, while the Issas are linked closely with Somalians. Later, in 1862, the French began the colonization efforts and secured the French territory of the Afars and Issas. However, as time went on, tensions between the indigenous groups and the French began to increase. This eventually sparked into rebellion and acts of violence against the French, forcing the French to withdraw in 1977. With its newfound freedom, the land claimed independence, naming itself Djibouti and electing Hassan Gouled Abdeddon as president. During this time, Djibouti, despite being in the middle of the two rival countries of Ethiopia and Somalia, remained peaceful by keeping themselves strictly neutral in foreign affairs. However, there were ethnic difficulties between the Afars and the Isas, where most Afars were ousted from positions of power. This led to a dominance of Aces in civil services. During this time, Djibouti also went, underwent difficulties in its urban areas, including poor infrastructure, high living costs, and the displacement of many city residents. In 1992, a new constitution was passed, ending the Isa dominant party state and allowing more multiple parties. However, ethnic tensions reached a peak and a civil war broke out between the two ethnic groups. It ended with a peace agreement, allowing the FRUD party of Afars to become ministers in the government. Gele was later appointed as president in 2001, part of the UMP, the Union for the Presidential Majority, consisting of members from both the ISTA RPP and the Afar FRUD. Djibouti's relationship with its neighbor Eritrea resulted in conflict between the two. However, Eritrea's actions of taking Djibouti's land was heavily criticized by the African Union and the UN. During the next presidential election, a constitutional amendment abolished the term limit allowing Gouele to remain president after the election, eliciting boycotts from opposing parties. This resulted in a tense political climate, however, Gouele and the UMP party still hold four-fifths of its par parliamentary seats. In 1825, Djibouti's major religion, Islam, was introduced to the region. Most of the country currently practices Sunni Islam. The French acquired the port of Abak in 1862, later paving the way for the creation of the French Somaliland in 1888. After the European partitioning of Africa, Djibouti grew to greater prominence in the region after being declared the capital of French Somaliland in 1892. Five years later, Ethiopia signed a treaty with the French to gain parts of Djiboutin territory. In 1946, Djibouti created an overseas territory in the French Union, which gained a law body and a place in the French Parliament. Twelve years after that, Djibouti joined the French community. In 1967, Afars and Europeans elected to stay in the French community and the French Somaliland was renamed the French Territory of the Afars and the Issos. In 1977, the French Territory of the Afars and Issos became independent. The Djiboutian Civil War was a conflict between the two ethnic groups of Afars and Issas in Djibouti. The conflict first started with the Front for the Restoration of Unity and Democracy FRUD, that called for greater political participation of the Afars. The war started in November 1991, with the FRUD assaulting the town of Obok in an attempt to rescue FRUD prisoners. However, the FRUD was crushed by Djiboutian soldiers. Later, the rebel FRUD seized all military posts in the north of the country and laid siege to the city of Tajur and Obok. Most of the fighting was concentrated in the north of the country, with the acceptance of a conflict in the capital. In February of 1992, France came in to aid the government and negotiate a truce that ultimately failed. The government's final offensive captured most of the rebel bases. The civil war resulted in the creation of a multi-party democracy for the country. Recently, Djibouti has been greatly impacted by a massive tropical storm across the Horn of Africa. The storm had winds of 60 miles per hour and caused massive damage to crops and infrastructure. The storm hit both Somalia and Djibouti, affecting at least 30,000 people. Additionally, the storm caused severe flooding in the affected countries, affected countries flooding homes and stranding people. The UN estimates that 700,000 people in flood-affected areas will need livelihood support. Recently, Djibouti and Ethiopia have brokered a deal to develop and operate a port during Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's visit to Djibouti. It was said that Djibouti would also be allowed to take stakes in Ethiopia's telecoms industry or other infrastructure. Orders were given to the two countries' foreign ministers and economic ministers to work on the detailed specification and technicalities. 
This is significant because it is the first time the Ethiopian government requested for joint port development and discussion with Djibouti. China and the U.S. are at odds over their respective military bases in Djibouti. Pentagon rep Dana White has said that Chinese personnel in Djibouti have been using lasers to target the eyes of American pilots, while China has denied the accusations. The conflict here has developed because China has long desired to expand its territory in the region, something that America opposes. Another reason is that the Chinese military base is close to the American military base established after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Language is a large part of Djibouti's culture. Because of its many ethnic groups, people speak languages such as Somali, Afar, Arabic, French, and many other languages. The two major religions present in Djibouti are Islam and Sunni Muslims. Afar music is similar to the folk songs of the countries in the Horn of Africa like Ethiopia, but has distinct Arabic influences. Somali folklore has a strong influence and their songs are mainly pentatonic. Djiboutians use different instruments like oud, bolire, and tambura. For tr traditional clothing, men wear a sound-like garment known as makawis, or which go around the waist. Traditional women wear dirac, a long diaphanous voil dress that, ha that is lightweight and made from polyester and cotton. Djiboutians also wear traditional Arabian pieces such as jalabiya for men and jilbab for women, a cultural garment closely resembling the Arabian thobe, but with a wider cut. Jilbab is a loosely fitted coat similar to a hijab. Like other North African countries, the art from Djibouti often utilizes geometrical shapes in its design and motifs. The art that I've created here, as previously mentioned, is based not only on art from Djibouti, but North African art overall, where it utilizes a lot of geometric shapes on its design and motifs. For my art piece, I created a collage of Djibouti lifestyle. This, or this photo and the bottom three here all show a common market in Djibouti, where 40% of the population go to get their groceries or anything they might need. This photo shows a regular apartment complex, and this one shows a church. This one shows a regular middle-class citizen wearing whatever uh, the, the usual clothing. It's very Western. He's wearing a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. This one shows a famous beach where most of the Djib uh, go for their vacations. And the middle top one shows an airport. My piece of culture is from the Djiboutian president's 2015 speech to the UN. While not the most important commonly spoken language in the country, French is used in politics and education. The language is a remnant of a colonial French past. Avant de commencer mon discours, je souhaiterais saisir cette occasion pour rendre un hommage appuyé à la mémoire de son excellence Robles Oyhale, représentant permanent de Djibouti auprès des Nations Unies et ambassadeur de la République de Djibouti aux États-Unis. Mon pays et moi-même avons perdu un frère et un grand patriote, la famille des Nations Unies, a quand elle perdu un collègue et une amie. In English, this means the following. Before beginning my speech, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the memory of His Excellency Robles Ohaye, permanent represent representative of Djibouti to the United Nations and ambassador of the Republic of Djibouti to the United States. My country and I have lost a brother and a great patriot. The family of the United Nations has lost a colleague and a friend. So in learning about Djibouti, I think a really significant thing I learned about the country was the fact that even though it had a very relative short history, it still underwent a lot of changes, such as its own civil war between two conflicting groups. Something I really admire about the country is probably how the Afars and the Issas managed to somehow band together and drive the French out when they no longer wanted the French colonizing them. I think something that people should know about the country is probably the fact that Djibouti itself isn't what you would think of a stereotypical African country. A lot of aspects of its society is westernized. I think a place that I would like to go in Djibouti would probably be Day Forest National Park since it seems like a really pretty and interesting place. The most significant thing that I learned about Djibouti is that it used to be a French colony. I admire most that it's a stable country in a region that's fairly unstable. People should know that the, that the country is very diverse and has a lot of different types of food, especially in the capital. Uh, one place that I'd want to visit if, if I went to Djibouti would be the coral reefs because it's a scuba because I'm a competitive swimmer. So while researching the country of Djibouti, one thing I really uh, found remarkable about the country was that it was a very westernized society in comparison to everything I thought I knew about the African countries. It's also not very stereotypical of a country. They're thriving very well off. While they might not be as modernized or as powerful as like maybe the US or uh, any other more modernized countries, they're still well off on their own. And I think it's remarkable how they still manage to find and keep going. Um, what I admire most about the country is, well, as all the African countries did, when the European colonization 
fell. I think that their road to recovery was pretty remarkable too, considering they had two, I think, minority groups, and so they would have to work aside those differences in order to create a bigger country for the better good.